Hi guys, welcome to another edition of The Big Shift, where we go right into fascinating life journeys and really reveal what makes these exceptional journeys so fascinating and exceptional. Today I have another wonderful guest, Mr. Sean Atwood. How are you, Sean? Great, Thank you, Thank you for having me on. Really enjoyed our walk, our multi-hour walk the other week. That was fun. Yeah, it was wonderful seeing you, Sean, you know, and, um, you know, we're going to go into your journey here, right, really, really in depth. Now, I know you went to prison in Arizona and all this stuff, so I'm going to go straight for the content, and we'll come back at where you, where you grew up and all this stuff. Now, you went away to a supermax prison in the States. How did you end up in the States is the first thing, Sean. Do you want to tell us about that? So... My family members from after World War Two, some of them were dating Americans, GI brides, and they ended up moving to the States, to Chicago, and then to Arizona. So over time, I ended up with two aunts I was very close to. My dad's sister's actually in Arizona. I was visiting them as a kid. And I just, I was dazzled, you know, by the sunshine and the swimming pools and the American women heard the British accent and rolled the red carpet out. Thinking, I want some of this when I finish at university. So that's what I ended up doing. They love English people over there, Sean. I know that, right? So uh, you got into, uh, you was a stockbroker was the first thing. So, you know, your journey is unique where you had a lot of success in the straight world. What was that journey about and what was your first job? How did you get into the stockbroking uh, area? So, at my high school, which was St. Joseph's in Widnes, I had an economics teacher called Mr. Dillon. And not many of us chose economics. There was only about six in my year group. Mm. And he saw I had an aptitude and he started to give me classes of my own. So I would sit with him and he'd have the Financial Times open and I explain all the different columns, you know, the high, year high, year low, P ratio, dividend, percentage change on the day. So he was explaining to me what all these numbers meant when I was only about 14. I went down with this library and I ordered all kinds of books on the stock market. Not just numbers books, but I learned over time that it was a psychological phenomenon. So I, as a teenager, I was ordering books like Le Bon, The Crowd, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds like by Charles McKay and just I've got this manic energy that I throw into things when I get interested in them and that's what I was doing from this teenage so watch that movie Wall Street Gordon Gecko greed is good that became my motto I'm thinking I've got to be a millionaire by age 30 and I'm going to do it through the stock market so did you take off, you know, and I know someone who knows Jordan, Jordan Belfry, right? You know, we hope we get him on the show, guys, soon, really. You know, we have a link to Jordan. Um, was it guys like this that you kind of looked up to as a, as a kind of a thing in that way? So Gordon Gecko was the protagonist in Wall Street, the movie, hmm. and he was a corporate raider. So the corporate raiders, the big-time short sellers... Um, were the people I idolised as a teenager. And this is going to sound crazy to some of my viewers, but one of my idols back then, and I read his book, was George Soros. Because George Soros had shorted the British pound mm. and he'd filed, he'd made, I don't know if it was hundreds of millions or a billion or something, he'd filed the biggest tax return ever. And to me, these were the gods. I was only a kid. These were the gods of the financial world. So George Soros, um, Ivan Boesky, who ended up going to prison, mm. he was another one. And there's also, if you go back historically, Edwin Levery, I think his name, he mm. wrote a book about short selling and trading. And he was one of my idols as well. I actually have a friend in Miami, uh, John, Johnny Irish, mm. you know, and he, uh, he was there in the old days with the Wolf of Wall Street, really. You know, he told me a story about how one guy they took for seven million, seven million in one year. You know, he said he had nine million in there 
Well, when they left him, he had two million. I mean, that's unbelievable. True story. So, um, yeah. So I wasn't looking up to those guys. Mm. That was something that came much later. Was the the penny stock brokers of the nineties? I was looking at historically who had been these corporate raiders who've been making all this, this big money. All the money, the right way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I get it. So, right, you know, you've got that obsession about it, Sean. I get that. And um, what was your break? How did you get into it? Did you get the economics degree? And then you went on, you got a yeah, chance. Yeah, so my work? business degree, business studies economics degree, um, my professor back then, Sir Patrick Minford, he was economic advisor to Margaret Thatcher. So Liverpool University had a very serious reputation for economics and business mm. and I took that to Arizona I wanted to be an investment analyst but they didn't have investment analyst positions in Phoenix Arizona but there's a lot of money out there mm. it's like a retirement community Sun City there's a lot of wealthy people in Paradise Valley so there's a big stockbroker community and that's what I became was a stockbroker you know, and I know we deal, we deal with a lot of companies now, many of which are going to IPO. So I know just what a specialist area this is, certainly. You know, as you go up into these, high, these higher business, business levels, investment, uh, you know, and all of this. So how did that really start for you when you started to get successful, uh, Sean, with that? Ooh. You didn't just go, obviously, there's a, there's a transition. Who introduced you to it where you became a proper stockbroker and it was working for you? So I got rejected by a lot of the firms and I was given an interview and I got hired by a company who are now defunct called Cobra Financial. And that was Wolf of Wall Street penny stockbroker outfit. I partnered up with another young broker in there and we realized what they were doing and these guys yeah. had like Italian mafia connections this big bald guy came in with a cane and these other gangsters and it was it was it was uh, it was an interesting first experience fresh out of uni so I partnered up with this other young broker when we realized what they were doing yeah. we photocop we came in at night and photocopied all of the accounts and found a legitimate firm to hire us and stole a lot of their clients because there was newspaper articles coming out exposing that these guys were taking people's monies and putting them into chop stocks and people were losing the money corporate corporate espionage right so yeah, yeah. so look um was you good at it sean was you good at it did you learn quick did you have an aptitude did you earn loads of money no, how did but, it go okay so i had anxiety from being a teenager social anxiety so but I had this other drive to be successful. So they were competing forces causing this drama inside me. And what happened was I learned quickly from that first outfit, Cobra Financial, that stock brokerage is glorified telesales. I had to call 500 numbers a day. 490 yeah. would tell me to piss off. Yeah. I'd have 10 who would accept my business card through the mail with a brochure. And out of that 10, maybe one of them would open an account and buy some shares. So, driven to try and make money because it was commission only. If you're not opening the account, you're not making any money. I had to call 500 people a day and it breaks you in with all these people just telling you to piss off all day long. It breaks you in to telesales. But the first couple of years I was living off cheese on toast and bananas, yeah. worried I was gonna have to come home because it was commission only. And I wasn't making any money. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, doing very well. But the five years in, I was the, by then I was the top guy in the office. We've all seen the pursuit of happiness, right? Yeah. You know, we've all seen that journey and we know what it takes to be successful. Extraordinary behavior. Yeah. Right, over an extraordinary period of time, I always say. And I always say as well, you know, to people, and I've learned, Sean, it's not how clever you are, it's how you're clever. How, how, how you're clever. How you're clever. How, how you're clever. Not manage. necessarily yeah. that how intelligent you are. Yeah. You know, I know many people, PhDs, really, mm. really highly qualified academics, but they're not super rich and they're not super successful because it's how you're, how you're clever. When you're clever and who you're clever with. So look, um, what was you earning then? Five years in, you know, you've gone off this. Was you really successful at it, Sean? Yeah, so my sales commissions by five years in, I'm grossing like half a million a year. Right, that's, I've got that's my, great I've money. I've got my own right? office, my own secretary, my own cold callers. 
I can just strut into the office whenever I want. Mm. Before that, you had to be in for the six o'clock in the morning sales meeting. And I was cold calling till nine, 10 at night. Getting your ass kicked. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so look, <clears throat> you know, it's starting to work for you. You've mastered it. How long did that go on for then in the corporate world doing that as a stockbroker? So I flew my best friend from childhood over, wild man who recently died and his funeral was just before Christmas. Yeah. And he had been in prison for a violent act. And idealistically, I was looking to give him a good life as a wrestler. I thought we could channel his aggressive energy into becoming a wrestler. But when wild man came over, <laughs> I rented him a place near the Georgian Dragon English pub thinking he would just have a beer with the expats. But within weeks, me and my girlfriend went over there one night and we knocked on the door and a bunch of Mexicans answered the door and we said, where's Peter? And they said, there's no Peter here. I said, Peter, yeah, he lives here. Oh no, we don't want Peter. Not Peter, Peter. And they all pulled guns out on us. So me and my girlfriend were backpedaling across the street and Peter Wildman just strides over the road, smiling at us. We're like, you just nearly got us shot and killed. What's going on? Mm. And he said, look, they're crack dealers. They like to move around a lot. So I've rented them that place. They're letting me stay in their place over the road. And they're giving me as much crack as I want for free because they're buzzing because I can inhale a hundred dollar crack rock in one breath. Now, Peter was, um, he had to move out of that place because it ended up with a corpse on the doorstep. I moved him into another place with um, some women and a nightclub bouncer. And within days he put the nightclub bouncer's head through a wall and that guy was seen running through the complex with plasterboard and pe powder all over his, his face. Then the women took him to another place over in Tempe. And that place became party central, absolutely nonstop. So he had all of the street people in there homeless, he had Italian Mafia gangsters, Russian Mafia gangsters, Mexican Mafia, um, Native American transsexual street prostitutes, trans Oh, nine yards. A whole variety of people. King's, King's Cross Station. And so he was, he was that's king. That's all happening. He, was, he was king of the, of the, the all like, wherever he went, he just, they worshiped him, they people. worshiped him. Yeah. But I, I started to see them during that first visit. I'm emotionally immature, and I can only get about you know 20 to 50 uh, ecstasy pills off the local dealers at these weekend apartment parties in Wildman's apartment. And I, I, people are just demanding ecstasy, mm. and I'm giving it away for free, because I'm just showing off I've got the most money. But then my business studies starts, to, the, the antennae starts to go, and I'm thinking, hmm, you know what? Perhaps there's an arbitrage opportunity here. I could make money selling ecstasy, quit the stock market stuff. I've got enough money just to trade anyway, day trade, and just start to make money full time for the party scene. And that's where my emotional immaturity and greed and ego took over. I was only in my twenties <laughs> and I started to fancy that it was, I was living like a character out of a movie, hanging out with Wild Man, meeting all these gangsters that he was introducing me to. Right, so I see it and look, you know, this is a classical mistake, right? I mean, I've seen this before many times. So you're mixing, you know, the immature, immaturity of a 20 something plus, really, really successful, you know, with that kind of money. And I've seen these guys, which, you know, I've even seen family members do it. We've all been there, I've been there myself. You're not ready for that kind of money. You don't know what to do with it. You haven't the maturity, right? All the knowledge, all the learning, it always ends up bad, right? Usually more often than not. So you're over there, you know, you're over there in the States. You're brought over a wild man who's kind of a close friend. You have a real, you know, a real thing there. Obviously there's a, there's a bond there. He's obviously, his behaviour is off the wall still. You know, he's got a lot of growing to do. He's had red dots in his head since a child had told him to hurt people. Yeah, so he's getting... Right, so, right, you know, so a lot of people would say, Sean, devil's advocate, are you kidding? You know, you're making half a million pound 
a year, give or take. You've worked the way, all the way through that. It's obviously working for you. Yeah, you know, we get it. You've got a friend and you kind of get pulled into stuff and there's beer pressure and all this stuff. But how stupid can you be then to sell yourself this lie in your own head that I'll give that up and I'll go into the drugs game. I've just got to ask. And this is a life lesson for young people because that when you give up the slow and steady progress you're on and you just abandon it for excitement, it's going to have some dark consequences which we're going to get to. But the point here is it's not about money and it is about ego. I'll give you an example. Mm. So I've written multiple books about Escobar. Mm. He was worth, they estimate, up to 30 billion. His brother Roberto said, Pablo, we're in a position where we can just buy our own island. Why don't we just kick back, retire? I'm paraphrasing. We won't get shot by rival gangsters. We won't get arrested by the cops and do the rest of our lives. We'll stop it. That's right, yeah. And you know what Pablo said? I'm the man. I've got tens of thousands of people working for me. I decide which president is going to be in power in Colombia. And you want me just to go off and play it safe and live on some island? Are you fucking kidding me? So once you got a taste of that lifestyle, me and we were joking, we were like, we're, we're like characters out of Pulp Fiction right now. You know, we're like living in a movie. We're like in our twenties and we're just buzzing off there. So it's the addiction to the lifestyle mm -hmm. and the feeding of the ego. My ego became as big as the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Made everything else irrelevant. All that slow and steady progress I'd had since 14 years old in the stock market. I threw that out the window because I wanted to be the man. I'm partying all weekend long. You know, striptease women are coming up to me, thanking me for the parties and thanking me for the pills. And it's just, you know, drug fuel insanity takes over. <clears throat> Let me just say as well, look, you know, I mean, it's a classic mistake on the street. I've seen it time and time, time and time again with guys. I was even there myself, you know, with addiction, 12 years clean out. People who know my story, I've been through that. But I know that when you're in the grip of something like that, your mind is not your own. So you are selling yourself bullshit more often than not. I mean, it's as simple as that. Right, so anyway, we've explored that, Sean. Can I just right, add one thing that. to that? Yeah, of course, yeah. And when you're in that mode that you perfectly described, you surround yourself with people in the same mode. So you all reinforce each other's insane behavior mm. and there's no one to put the brakes on. And the drug scrambles your decision-making processes so you don't see what you've become. The, the scrambled brain is telling you this is the smartest decision in the world. And the stuff you're doing is completely wacky. Look, look, you know, there's a real lesson there about drugs because this is the deception. Yes. Even in the first rule of war is deception. Yes. That's how bad the drugs is because it would tell you you're the man when you're passing street windows, you're the man, even when you have no teeth in your head, no money in your bank account and you're living in your own head in your own film script. I have to say that just to put the reality down of what drugs is and how it destroys life. It's as simple as that, right? So look, okay, right. So we've got the dynamic now, what is happening over here and you're losing the plot, Sean, right? So you let, you know, so you let, you let your straight, straight life go that you've built up in the stock market. Well, you've got a few quid round you, I guess. Yeah, what yeah, happens? Yeah, yeah. So my straight life is gone, but I'm not completely detached from the stock market. I've flown people from the UK and put money into bank accounts and stock market accounts in their names, and I'm trading in their names. And as I'm going into the criminal community then, I'm like flying these people out and putting houses and cars in their names mm. to, as part of the criminal enterprise, because my mm. idea is, if a house gets raided in the name of someone I've flown over from the UK, where does that trail end? Mm. If the, they pull the cops, pull a car over that's got drugs in it and it's someone who's been flown over from the UK, where does that trail end? So I'm, I'm like the Chinese, I'm always thinking like five to 10 years ahead on this uh, plan. And the, mm. you know, the story arc of Goodfellas and all these other movies, Casino, um, mm. Blow, like you, you, you've jumped ahead to the, the darkness of what happens but there, there, in my case, there was three or four years of the upslope before there was about a two year downslope. And in the beginning, you know, it's glitz, it's glamour. 
you've got all these beautiful women around you and you've got all these, you know, you've got your bouncers around you, arms to the teeth, and all this stuff is just feeding your ego. And I, I was able to keep that going for um, a few years before it, it started to go over that hump when Sammy the Bull's crew moved in. Sean, it's always the same in this, right? Someone said to me once, you know, a great analogy, you know, about drugs, you know, I said, Stephen, it's like something that is stroking your bollocks at the start that becomes a claw that is gripped so much around them, you're in bad trouble. You know, there's always that. It's a progressive disease uh, addiction which means it'll always get worse, and the next time it's always 20 times better, and it's a downhill slalom. Right, so I'm guessing now, and I know that your life is coming apart at the seams. We're on the downward slope now, right? How did you get into the ecstasy in a big way? Now, I know you had some dealings with the Mexican Mafia. You showed me some photos and different stuff. You know, you know, and I know what it's like in any city. Once you start getting into the scene or whatever, and you're kind of known, and you've got money, and you start getting into things, and you meet people, it's not long before like-minded people turn up as well. You know, and then like-minded minds they get together, you know, and they conspire. It's really as simple as that. You know, especially especially in the criminal fraternity. So. How did you start getting into the ecstasy, which was you was to be arrested with a large amount of ecstasy and go to maximum security prison for a long time at the end of this trail. But how did you start getting into the ecstasy then and the drug dealing and the parties in a big way? Okay, so when Wildman first came over and we had the apartment parties in a complex called Rancho Marietta in Tempe, that is where I met G Dog, who was a brother of the leaders of the New Mexico Mafia. I didn't know that that's who they were until a few years after I met him when they were all headline news. The criminal connections, it was like Wildman's first visit opened the door into that world for me. Because as a nerdy business graduate, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to make those links. But he was able to make links with absolutely anybody. Now, when you came to my house and we had our walk, you read some of my paperwork. I showed you a picture of G Dog because I wanted you to see the authenticity of my story. The lawyer, my lawyer, who was recommended to me by the New Mexico Mafia guys, that's the guy I picked up to represent the case of the United Front. He said there was so much paperwork for my case, it would have filled multiple rooms. And we could only look at it on a computer. And so I showed you just six pages of what filled multiple rooms. And for legal reasons, some of my stories over the years have had to be toned down. And you've seen in that paperwork those legal reasons. And you, you can verify that can't you that my story is legitimate and you've seen the actual police file. I did yeah yeah I've seen stuff you know and I asked for that you know you know proofs and you showed me that you know and I I'm happy with that Sean. Yeah yeah so the story arc is then that while man comes over and make the criminal connections he just goes absolutely berserk on that first visit he's unhousable he ends up living under a tree in Tempe Beach Park with a striptease dancer who likes to have her vagina tased and uh, he's got a Rambo knife and a baseball bat and he, he takes control of that area but him and the striptease dancer are like Bonnie and Clyde they're going on the rampage going in shops and taking things they're going in restaurants and running away without paying <laughs> and he end up getting he ends up getting arrested and deported for the first time so now there's a gap between when he actually comes back I think it's about two or three, maybe even years later. But I've got the criminal connections established now because during that visit, uh, we found out who the supplier was for the ecstasy out of LA. So two carloads of us went to that guy's house. I'm going to call him Sol. And we organized the purchase of a thousand pills. They were going for 25 to $30 in the clubs back then. And I was paying some around 12 for this this was the start pills. what year yeah. was this shown are we talking about we I, mean, talking, I remember them days we're right? talking 96 97 that's like say the mitsubishi pill era yeah i remember even yeah. earlier you know you're yeah. 90 91 i mean i went away and my sentence really really long sentence yeah 91 but so i remember just just yeah uh, 89 90 late 80s with the white doves yeah yeah in yeah. this country when i was a participant okay right so all right so we're mid 90s america now and um 
two car loads of us go out there. So it's me and Wildman in one car. And in the other car it is Seth, this other big big guy who became one of my bodyguards, and Acid Joey. He was a big guy as well, Native American and Navajo. Best dancer I've ever seen in my life. He was so fluid. People would form circles around him at the rave just to watch him dance. Sadly, every single one of those guys who went out to LA with me are now dead. Acid Joey was found dead in his swimming pool with all of his clothes on. I think he'd been on substances. Seth died a couple of years ago. He's, he's, he had a heart situation. And like I said earlier, Wildman died, multiple organ failure. Um, just before Christmas was his funeral. So we're sat outside this guy's house and we're waiting because he's not there. Mm. So we're like getting a bit pissed off and he keeps us waiting for ages. Have you seen that movie Point Break? I have, I can't remember it all, but yeah. The yeah, ga ga Gangster Surfers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where they go in and yeah, it's a good film. He ends up showing up with some real life gangster surfers. We're out in the cars and I, I'm like, wow, man, right, I better go in. Well, I was like, fuck this, he's kept us waiting for so long, I'm just going to kick his door in and take his fucking pills. And he's like, the red dots, red dots, telling me to do this. I'm like, chill, man, if we just do that, how are we going to have a reliable supply? We're going to get a bad reputation. So I told him to chill. I said, look, if I'm not out of here in 20 minutes, you guys can come and kick the door in and rescue me. But I'm just going to go in with the money now. So they, they chilled, and I went in. So Sol, I said, um... You've kept us waiting for you know a long time, blah blah blah. He apologised that he'd been off with the surfers. Uh, I'll go. And, I'll go. Have you got the money yet? Have you got the pills? I said, yeah, I'd like to try one. Now I always knew the taste of ecstasy because I'd done so much, and a pill should be like 100, 125 milligrams of MDMA and clay. Yeah, yeah. So I threw the pill in my mouth. He's like, do you want to chase? I'm like, no, I just want to taste it. So I'm chewing it in my mouth and tasting it, and it, it tastes right. So I hand over the pills. He hands over the pills, get in the vehicle, and I'm in a twin turbo Mazda RX-7, the blow-up model, looks like a spaceship. I've got DJ Sasha on the sound system. The seat is all fur, and as I'm, I've got a radar detector in the windshield. And this was back before I had any precautions about the police, properly, properly. So we got, we got all these fucking pills on us. I'm high as fuck on ecstasy. I'm feeling it come up because the, the fur on the seat's like starting to, starting to move my eyes go like this. Driving like between 100, almost 150 miles an hour on this badass freeway. Just, just, just rolling, rolling and rolling around in my seat. And um, got back to Wildman's apartment in Tempe, Arizona in record time. And um, those pills sold in one weekend, and that was the decision then, the fatal decision to stop being a stop. Both feet, both feet straight and, in, and go full, go full time. Because I saw how much money I could just make in one weekend and have fun, and not have to be on the phone doing calls all day. Right. So look, I see how you sold that to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Especially under the influence, right? You see, yeah. this is what happens. There's a lesson here mm -hmm. about. Don't believe the hype. And if you really want to be successful and happy and have your life or your business in an order, you need to have your own self in your own life in an order. Drugs fucks that completely, you know, to the point where I see people on that now. I, you know, I never blame no one, point no fingers, but, you know, I know what that brings with it, right? So you went full blast then, but you was doing parties and everything, right? The big parties in the air. And they was really good. Sean, back in the day, you know, I was there back in the day, you know, where we grew up in that period. We had unbelievable times, you know. Um, how did you get into the the big parties then? And what kind of parties are we talking about? Well, there's How many people present and stuff like once that? Once I started to apply my business studies knowledge to running an ecstasy trafficking operation, it went full on. So there's a term in economics called horizontal integration and vertical integration. So if you are sourcing the ecstasy mm. from a middleman out of LA and then selling it to people who are coming through Wildman's bedroom window, which is how that first thousand got sold, then how can we streamline this looking at the economic model? So to streamline it, and this happened over a two or three year period, you wanna source the pills 
not from the middleman, but go through Holland, which is the actual supplier where he's getting them from. You want to be in charge of the events, whether it's a nightclub or a rave, and have your own security team operating so that then the house completely controls the flow of the drugs. If there's any outsiders come in, you shake them down, those pills are recycled to the house. You don't give them over to the cops, you just say, look, you're lucky, we're not giving you to the cops, fuck off. We and, sell them. And then they're resold and the house profits from those. And then, when Wildman was there during that first visit, the ravers called me the Bank of England or English Sean because they knew I'd made all this money in the stock market. I was showing up at these like warehouse parties on the south side in my RX-7. So they started calling me the Bank of England and they were coming to me with their party ideas and I was investing in their party ideas. But sometimes those little cliques of local people had squabbles. So wild men and me would preside over them coming in and they would come and give their side of their argument, their side of the dispute, and we would help them settle those squabbles. And by doing that, we united all these different factions into our economic uh, structure. So there was like, approximately at any one time, there'd be like 10 to 20 different factions yeah. selling ecstasy for me. Each faction had a head. We would have a crime family dinner every month where the heads of the factions would come and we'd discuss stuff. And so it really was structured like a corporation. I had a right hand man, Cody Bates. He's also dead now. If people want to research his story, um, he ended up in a Scientologist rehab. They put him on meds that had been, uh, a side effect was suicide and he hung himself. He got depressed after we all got arrested. He said we were like the family to him. We saved his life. We gave him purpose and he got depressed and he went into this rehab and he hung himself and it's on a line the case it's on the courtney Bates. if people want to verify that as well so he was my right hand guy mm. he rented an apartment just for the cash because we knew we had to keep that the knowledge of that completely separate from everybody like i said i'd flown all these people from the uk i was funneling cash into the bank accounts into stock market accounts that was like a huge spider's web and my best friend, Wildman's cousin to this day, still laughs about all the money of Iran and Iraq that, that, went, that went into his name. Now also integration, another part of integration is owning or investing in rave clothing music stores. So we had those as well. They're selling the tickets Merchant for the Dyson. gigs. Dyson, yeah. Yeah, if, if, if you sell, if, you, if you're a rave store and you throw a rave, then you can go to the bank on a Monday with tens of thousands in cash and say that is the receipts for all the ravers coming into this party. If you add the tens of thousands in ecstasy sales onto that and put that in the bank, who fucking knows the difference? And it's not in my name either. So the clothing stores then would issue checks to the people I'd flown into the names of the people I'd flown over from the UK. They were completely unarrestable because they're out of the country. And those checks would go into those bank and stock market accounts. And that's why it had this big spider's web. And the prosecutor said, um, as well as, you know, I had so many aliases, they couldn't even put my indictment. They couldn't even, you know, tr track all the money or anything like that either, where, where all the money went. But we did end up blowing it like you do when, when things go, so that's get hurry. Look, I get it, you know, and I can see how you've, you've integrated the structure there. You know, yeah. when, a, when a criminal enterprise starts to become successful, and expand really, really quickly. You do have to structure it and organize it with team leaders or whatever you want to call it, like a kind of a corporate a corporate entity. Then it survives and keeps expanding. Well, people don't know about businesses when they upscale and expand. It's all about the systems behind. You will not be able to do it or upscale properly without forging them proper systems into the back end. Now look, okay. I've got, I've got one thing. Yeah. One, one, one of the systems behind that to, to ensure that people don't snitch is the legal benefits that everybody had who worked for me. Because people who worked for Sammy the Ball, they didn't have the legal benefits and they would come to me. So if you got arrested, you got a lawyer assigned to you right away. If you had no previous, you were more than likely not even going to do any prison time. You do a bit of jail time. We bail you out right away. And everyone was schooled in exercising their right to remain silent. This is what the New Mexico Mafia guys schooled me in. They said, look, if someone pulls you over leaving our house 
and the cop says, I want to search your vehicle. You could just say, no, I'm in a hurry. They've got to have probable cause. He said, and then they told me if they have probable cause and they are searching you, you exercise your right to remain silent and you say, I want to speak to this lawyer. And that was the very same lawyer we used for the entire case as the national, as the uh, United Front. Yeah. Okay, I get it. Now look, with this Sammy the Bull thing, for instance, yeah. Sammy the Bull, now Sean, mm. there's been a lot of stuff said about Sammy the Bull, you know, I just interviewed Michael, Michael Francis, yeah. we was also talking about Sammy, mm -hmm. massive story, people would know who Sammy the Bull is anyway. Now, regarding you, some people have said you met him, or you come across him, or it was people, or you didn't clarify, what actually happened there with this? What, what, what is this about? Okay, so, from what I've just described to you now, right, by the peak of the rave stuff, I'm a shadowy figure now, operating from behind the scenes. I'm in a million dollar house on the side of a mountain in the gated guarded community called Sin Vacas in Tucson, Arizona, where Joe Bonanno Sr. is like one of my neighbors and further down the mountain range is Paul McCartney. People know my name now, they know English Sean, they know the Bank of England, but they don't know who I am because I'm just staying out of the public view because I know things have got so hurry. My top sales guy, Sammy the Bulls crew, they enticed him to a nightclub in Scottsdale and knocked his teeth out, took all of his money, took all of his pills. So we were beefing with the guys on the streets yeah. who were working for the Gravano Enterprise. And this always happens, you know, with this kind of money, and I get it, when the money comes in, you can afford it, Sean, you have to go somewhere, you need a bow hole, been there, done it, know how this thing is, you're building it up. It soon, get, it soon gets hairy, the soon other people now, they start, because it's the money and the power and the control. So, where there's drugs, this is where the violence comes now on the street from other, other people who want to encroach on the territory, right? Think they can come, they can do it better, or they're going to take what you've got usually, and that's the end of it, right? So, we're getting into this now, right? This is the second phase of how this story always goes, right? So, it's people on the street. But you never actually, where, where was Sammy the Bull now then? I mean, he's in America, still he's up, he's up. All right, let's go over this whole Sammy the Bull situation. I appreciate the opportunity for me to clarify this to some people who may have misunderstandings because of trolls. So, <laughs> I have never ever met Sammy the Bull or ever claimed to have met Sammy the Bull. Trolls have contacted every single person from my past life. I've written about, you know, my life story is a trilogy of books. They've contacted all my ex-girlfriends. They've contacted my prosecutor. They've contacted Sammy the Bull. Desperate to find holes in my story. And I would like to ask them, where are these holes? Because I don't see any. But they're desperately trying to. And I view it as one of Escobar's favorite quotes was, envy kills more people in Colombia than cancer. A lot of people have started podcasts like mine. Um, I've had my YouTube channel for 12 years. I've had my online blog for 20 years, John's Jail Journal. So I've been doing this now for almost two decades. A lot of new people have come on the scene. Some of those people have made what I would describe as 48 Laws style power plays against me. And there has been a cottage industry of trolls that have formed around this to try and blow holes in my story and take me down. And one of them that they're claiming is a victory is they contacted Sammy the Bull and said, this guy was a TV presenter over in England, Sean Atwood. He's saying, you know, obviously they said some, some, something like, he's saying, you know, he met you and he was competing with you in ecstasy and they've blown a load of smoke up his fucking ass. So he, he then, did a video response saying, I've never met this Sean Atwood guy, never fucking heard of him, he must be full of shit, I hear he's a TV presenter. I'll sink my teeth into his arm. Yeah, all if that. he'd have bumped heads with me, I'd be picking his bones out of my teeth. Uh, no, I completely understand why Sammy the Bull has responded like that, because of how... Absolutely, people think he's... You know, because of people how, do, they think you're talking bad about them and stuff like that. Then because of, there's a good chance they're going to respond. Right? Yeah, because of how he was approached. So let me ask you this, Stephen. So Sammy the Bull was the underboss of the Gambino crime family under John Gotti. He became the highest ranking member of the Mafia to go police informant. And in witness protection in Tempe, Arizona, it is alleged, I'll say, because Sammy's still denying this, it is alleged by 
the authorities that he set up an XC ring in competition with mine, which is documented in the media and documented in the police reports. And certainly the people who were working for the, let's call it the Gravano Enterprise, were bumping heads with my people. Whether he was running it or not, I'll get to the interactions I had with his son in a minute. His son was definitely running it. So this is where the disinformation and the misunderstandings are arising now. He was approached, right? Sean Atwood's talking all this stuff about you. T English TV presenter said he bumped heads with you. I was a shadow, shadowy figure operating from behind the scenes in America when I was running my XC ring. No one knew who Sean Atwood was. So if I said to you, Stephen, back when you were engaged in this criminal activity, this guy called Jim Jones said he was bumping heads with you and he's talking all this shit about you, your immediate response would be, I've never heard of Jim Jones, right? Because Jim Jones was a guy who had a street, a street, some kind of street name, something like that. You wouldn't say, yeah, I, I knew this guy because so that's completely impractical that he would have known me in the first place. Then, I've never ever said I've met him. All I've ever said is I've met his son. So when his son got arrested for the XC ring, I think there was two rounds of arrests with those guys. They got arrested in, I think it was 2000, and there was 57 co-defendants, but a lot of them got out on bail. Anyway, g Dog, brother of the New Mexican Mafia leaders, who was one of my bodyguards, he walked into Gravano's cell, the son, because Gravano, the son, was talking shit about the English, me and Wild Man. And G-Dog set him straight and said, look, the English are with us, letting those guys know who had our back. Now, Gravano's son, Gerard, got out on bail, but he got rearrested and got put back in. And the guards, because they were a bit of a pranksters, when we were going to court, it's a long process to go to court, they chained Gerard Gravano to Wildman, who was already documented in local media as the lead enforcer for our criminal enterprise, to see what would happen. And Wildman's like, what do you want me to do? And I said, look, don't do anything because we don't want more charges. These guys all got arrested before us. They probably know what the prosecutor's coming at them with, all the tricks. He can tell us, you know, and give us advice on how we should be handling things in our case. So we sat with Gerard that night, because they wake you up in the night, of course, the next day, and we discussed everything that, all the dirty tricks the prosecutor was playing and, and things like that. And in, in their case, 57 people agreed to cooperate, all 57. And in my case, we had the New Mexican Mafia United Front lawyer, and um, over, 100 people, uh, over 100 people were arrested, only four agreed to um, cooperate which was remarkable and it really gave the prosecutors not much to go with because I never ever got arrested with any drugs. Early you said I got arrested with a lot of XC, I never did. I quit a year before the SWAT team came. So so with, with um, Sammy the Bull, I'm addicted to watching his YouTube channel, his videos. He's a great storyteller. I offered to fly him to London through an intermediary to sit down and to discuss this. Uh, and just to hash it out what actually happened. My question for him is, was he actually running the Enterprise because, the XC Enterprise, because he's saying he, he didn't run it and he was told by his lawyer to take that charge because it was a less serious charge from the other charges that he was facing. But I know for a fact that Gerard Gravano was one of the leaders of that. Now, in my previous stories, I've said, you know, I was bombing heads with Sammy the Bull's crew all my videos are titled Sammy the Bull's Crew, but if he wasn't running that crew, if it was his son, then maybe I have made an error in saying it was Sammy the Bull's crew. But according to all the police reports, according to Sammy the Bull's conviction, and according to all the media, Sammy the Bull was running, running the experiment. Right, well look, I'm sure, you know, there's a high probability Sammy will see this or hear this, John can respond that or whatever. Another thing is, I am actually have a line to his son, Gerard. You know, we're friends on Facebook and there is a... So, you know, pe people can reach out or whatever. There's no thing. It's very easy. It's very transparent. You know, I'm just not into the nonsense, period. People who know me, they know that. But look, Sean, look. 
there's a lot of controversy around certain things and we're going to go back to that we're going to go back to that right you know i'm going to ask you tough questions on that please do man give you the chance to answer some yeah, of this yeah, stuff yeah go for it but look right so um you get you get arrested by SWAT. it all comes yeah, tumbling yeah. down yeah, yeah. You know, you've told us the bit about how it was built, all the intricacies of about how it was put together, some of the violent incidences that produced, and then you go to prison in Arizona. Now, I have to ask, you know, I've done a lot of research on you, Sean, as well, for this interview, yeah, obviously, yeah, as I do yeah. all my guests. Yeah, yeah. Now, with Arizona, there's this prison in the mountain. Is this the prison in the mountain? Uh, that's Colorado, is it? No, no, that's Colorado. That's, you're that's the other one. With where Sammy the Bull was. That's the ACS right. Supermax I'm just right. Colorado. So you was in. You were still in the Supermax, though, right? I did a brief in Arizona. I did a okay. So I ended up in about ten different prisons over my almost six years of incarceration because of the prosecutor's dirty tricks. I ended up in maximum security for almost a year, and I ended up in Supermax for about three months. But the first twenty-six months were in the most famous jail in America, run by the notorious Sheriff Joe Arpaio. He claimed to be America's toughest sheriff, and I've got videos on my channel of guards murdering mentally ill prisoners in that jail. I've also got a video of an early brother gang member, Peter Van Winkle, murdering uh, uh, another uh, white prisoner who refused to beat someone up for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. This place was absolutely helter skelter. I mean, it was all racial gangs. The Nazis decided who lived or died if you were a white person. And it was just flooded with heroin, crystal meth, 90% injecting, two thirds approximately hepatitis C. Yeah, it was it was mayhem. So how did you survive in there, Sean? How did you survive well, in that environment? <laughs> you're, a, you're a stockbroker. Yeah, you've got into the criminal underworld. It's not you, you haven't got that programming. You didn't come from an inner city. <laughs> You've done very well at it. You've kind of missed a lot of the violence. You started to get into that violence because the money and the success brings that. Now you're in prison with some of the most dangerous, um, unhinged, you know, prisoners, uh, high security prisoners in the States. What was that like? How did you deal with it? I guess who was arrested with me. Wild man. Once everybody knew in the jail I was with Wildman, that was it. I never got attacked any time I was housed where Wildman was housed. The Aryan Brotherhood guys, by the end of what he did for them, offered him the full membership patch and he refused it. He said he didn't want any Nazi tattoos, he wasn't a Nazi. Mm. So Wildman was someone who on the streets had put work in for the Hells Angels, the cartel in Mexico, when he was on the run in Mexico, put work in for the New Mexico Mafia, and he was highly respected. So I was heart checked and charge checked by the AB guys, the torpedoes, as soon as I went in. But Wildman made it clear, you know, that I was with him. And when we went at the church services, we would sit on the back row together and then all the more and more co-defendants were getting arrested and we're all just in there hugging and the priest is told to shut up and people were in awe because the case had been on the news mm. and people were in kind of in awe um, of what we'd done. It lasted for a little bit anyway. <laughs> when it got in the news, I, yeah, got, I, got, I, I, got, I got milk, an extra milk with a breakfast for a while and an extra piece of the cheese that slowly melted into orange juice. As you do. <laughs> Yeah. As you do. So, to, but to answer your question more fully, Stephen, no, I'm not a violent person at all. And I hate violence, especially violence against women and kids. And that's why a lot of the stuff we do on the channel now is about that, the predators. So I learned to channel my people skills and my education into becoming my currency reading the paperwork for the prisoners. A third of them couldn't even read or write. When I was moved over to Max Security years later, it was a, how many men, a 30 man pod. There was about 10 Mexicans, nearly all were convicted murderers. And a lot of them couldn't read or write. 
and I was helping them write letters home in Spanish because I'd done some Spanish at college to their loved ones and they respected me for that uh, but the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang had a problem with a white boy helping another race but my uh, cellmate at that time was Joe a man and some guardian angels had come into my life throughout this one wild man wasn't there including Joe and he had a relationship with them because he was a crystal meth cook and he squashed that beef and I was given the green light to keep helping the Mexicans. Now later on, there was a guy called Two Tonys, a banana crime family associate, multiple homicide murderer, 740 plus years. And I started to write his life story. He really liked me. He liked me after I played him a game of chess. And once he had my back again, I was completely, um, you know, nothing, nothing happened. If I got attacked, for example, when, say we're months into writing to Tony's story and I got attacked and moved off that prison yard, he would be screwed because that project wouldn't have been finished. Yeah. So, so he, he's, he made he's it got clear. A, uh, you know, an incentive yeah, to, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and this is yeah. always good, Sean. And look, you know, I mean, it, for those who know my story, I was a cat A, I I've done over 12 mm. years, all large group, as yeah, I was even yeah. released as a cat A. I know the dynamics inside out, you mm -hmm. know, and what you've said there, if, you know, I take your word for it, Sean, about certain guys, when you're with a certain person in the, in the hierarchy who has the skills, who has the background, who is known, them groups are left alone. Unless your shit hits the fan, obviously with them, or they fall out with someone, another group of the, and this is what happened. So this is how, this is how you navigate it this dangerous, you know, this dangerous sentence, yeah? How long did you do? Just under six years. Right, so you've done six years and mm. you come out, what happened then when you come out? Oh man, there's a video of me, I think at Heathrow Gatwick Airport. I've been in prison transportation for days, including Connor, mm. where we're picking up and dropping off Mexicans. Then they put me on a regular flight from LA. Haven't slept in days, haven't shaved. I look like, on that video now where I'm hugging my mum and my dad and my sister, I'm like all bug-eyed and like shell-shocked and pale and I'm all stubbly. Yeah. As you can see, this guy's been through fucking some some shit. And Six years is a long time. In a, in that, in a hell of a place like that, that, it does with, something with, with, to with a that, human being. With that intensity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the very beginning in the jail, nearly every day someone's head was getting cracked against the toilet. I got used to the sounds of bodies getting thrown around, like that sack of potato sound. Mm. There was a mentally ill old man who wouldn't shut up mumbling and talking all day. I don't know what the gang did to him, but as I walked past him, blood just started squirting up the back of his head. I saw a guy with his leg pointing in the wrong direction. But over time you become established, and once you're not in the unsentence, because it's just helter skelter, so many people coming out, you, you establish yourself, you're helping people. Once you're sentenced, it's, there's not all that people coming in and out. Things calm down a bit, and by the end, yeah, of it, you in, find you find your place, Sean. I was in minimum Especially, security. You, you know, you find your level, uh, you yeah. find your people who you're around. You know, and you keep together. You know, yeah, this is yeah. the experience you keep together, and this is a protective kind of way of, and a comfortable way of navigating. Yeah, yeah. so much, so much trauma, adversity, yeah. being locked away, having all your freedoms taken. Yeah, right, yeah. right. I get that. So. Right, you come out and, you know, I know you've told me before that, you know, you come back to England and, you know, you was in your friend's ass and then you've gone... Now, look, you know, I know you've done TED Talks, you know, I know you're a prolific author. There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of your books out there, you know, uh, a lot of true crime stuff. I know uh, Random House, they took your life story at the start, right? You know, I know you've been on CNN, BBC... You know, you've done a lot of the media, media circuit, as a I, you know, uh, internationally even, you know. So, you know, it's fair to say along that journey, you are and you, you, you are a public figure, you know, in a sense with your work out there and prolifically in the media. Now, what drove you to change, to turn, Sean? Really good question, man. I'm glad you've asked this one because Let's wind the clock back now. I'm in the maximum security Madison Street Jail, 2003, 2004. And they're telling me I'm facing a maximum 200 year sentence. They've charged my girlfriend a year later with prescription fill 
prescription pill found in our medicine cabinet didn't have a written prescription next to it which is a class six felony so, and co-defendants can't visit co-defendants i'm not cooperating with the prosecutor hardly any of the co-defendants are pro co cooperating they have got, haven't got much of a case they're trying to break me down psychologically so i'm thinking 200 years of this in max security it is absolutely infested and flooded with cockroaches. They're over us all night long. I'm going days and days without sleep. They have to put me on meds to get to sleep in the end because they start tickling your feet, tickling your legs, going in your mouth, going in your ears. Even to this day, if someone tickles my hand, I flinch because I walk up so many nights and I'm tickling my hand. This is the Sonoran Desert. It's almost 50 degrees and there's no air coming in. You're being cooked alive in a concrete oven. Your entire body is covered in skin infections and bed sores. It looks like I spilled battery acid on my legs. I've got a pink eye infection. My eyelid is drooping down here and there's yellow pus coming out my eyeball. I can't sleep with the cockroaches. I can't sleep with the itchiness from the skin infections. My girlfriend's not seeing me anymore. And now they tell me I'm facing 200 years. I'm like, fuck this. I'm just gonna slash my wrist and bleed out. To rock bottom. Yeah, huh? yeah. A real rock I, I wanted to kill myself after I, I guarded the security walk and before I was going to do it I wanted to say goodbye to my family and friends and what I mean by that Stephen I was allowed seven photos in the jail so I get the photos out of my mum, my dad, my girlfriend, my sister and I'm looking at these photos and I'm, I'm looking at my mum and, 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 and I start thinking your mum's going to get a call from a foreign prison saying, sorry, Mrs. Atwood, but your son's fucking just slashed his wrists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I fucking... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I started crying at that point. And um, I couldn't put my mum through that. And that's what stopped me from doing it. And you know what, Stephen, I was a selfish, narcissistic, partying fucking animal. Just all I wanted to do was get high and after party and just all of us just be high and be insane. And I wasn't thinking about the harm I caused my mum and dad. thinking about others. I wasn't thinking about With the harm. With any type of yeah, responsibility, yeah, yeah. you know, at all. Now, look, let me just say, look, no matter what we've done, what we don't do, life is a journey. You know, the prerequisite is that we make mistakes, right? It's about learning from them. But, you know, if you don't have any values, any integrity, any good kind of knowledge that is you, that is authentic for you in your values, then you have nothing. Doesn't matter how much money that you have, right? Period. You know, that's it. Yeah. This is a maturity mm -hmm. thing, as well as, you know, as well as the journey thing, as well as a learning thing. Mm -hmm. But there it is, you know, there it is. There is the bottom line of that. So you're starting to, you know, you're starting to get the responsibility you know, and the accountability of your actions and you're starting to, you know, you start to feel in the right ways, you start to think in the right ways, you start to see in the right ways of what's gone on before, right? So this is the catalyst of the change. I mean, I get the rock, rock bottom shawl, right? So at that point, I mean, I know I've traveled my own redemption arc, right? My book's out there, all the rest of it, there's a film and pre-production about it, right? So. I get this, right? So more is revealed on the positive journey when, when we go into a, a transition, a metamorphosis, a, you know, our redemption, right? So what did you want to do? What did you want to be? What did you want to see? What was the next thing? Here's what I'm next. So I'm at the brink, I'm pushed to the brink of suicidal insanity and it crushed that English Sean persona out of me. That first year, if I'd have been released on bail, for example, I got out, I was still wild in the terms that I wasn't trafficking drugs anymore, but even that last year I wasn't trafficking, I was still leaving my girlfriend at home and going out with Wild Man and G-Dog and getting high and doing all my insane party behavior. So I was still addicted to the drugs and the lifestyle. So I was still wild first year. Second year, 200 year sentence, the prospect of that crushes that out of me and I start just thinking about the needs of other people and I thought previously prisoners lock them up throw away the key they are paedophiles they are rapists they are murderers they've got nothing coming I had no idea that prisoners 
were mostly people with addiction issues, people who'd suffered trial, childhood trauma, people who had, you know, to fill the private prisons, almost a million arrests a year for weed conviction. Average arrest in Sheriff Joe Pyro's jail was like a black kid or a Mexican kid with a little bit of weed getting a two to five year sentence because they had a prior conviction. Ridiculous. More than half of my friends in, in prison were soldiers, come back from wars with PTSD, didn't get any help from the government, ended up on street drugs to self-medicate and then ended up into criminality in prison. I was, the media, all they do is focus on extreme crimes, serial killers, murder, rapists, pedophiles, on one side. And on the other side, they say how easy it is. It's easy. The prisoners have got PlayStations and gourmet food and luxuries. And that keeps the public hating on the prison population. And I was one of them. Because I thought it was all paedophiles and rapists. And when I got in there and I saw it was the warehousing of all these vulnerable people for private prisoners to be making 50, 60,000 a year off the back of it, just one of the contractors. And I said to the guard, I said, how are you able to get away with all this? The human rights violations, the dead rats in our food, the cockroaches crawling all over us at night times, guards murdering mentally ill prisoners. And that guard said to me two things that set me off. And that was, the world has no idea what's going on in here. And the public does not give a shit about prisoners. So I thought, right. I've heard that before too. I thought, right, I'm going to fucking change this. So in America, you are allowed to have what's called a golf pencil. In this country, I think you'd have them in betting shops. So that tiny pencil sharpened against my cell door, I started writing everything down. Now, I couldn't just put that in the mail because the guards can open your mail but my aunt was visiting me in max security now in max security you aren't sat at a table it's like a plexiglass screen i go up there doing the penguin shuffle all cuffed up got my legal paperwork or whatever i'm releasing she my aunt's on the other side of the plexiglass screen and she's got a plastic phone i'm cuffed to the table with one hand and i've got the plastic phone in the other hand i was allowed to release property to her through the visitation officer. So this is stuff that has been um, used by me, legal paperwork, old books, letters. So everything I'm writing down about what's going on, I'm hiding it in my property release. Now, the first time I go up there, I'm shitting myself because I'm thinking he's gonna read through this stuff and find what I'm exposing. I'm watching it on the visitation officer's desk as I'm talking to my aunt, you know, I'm looking over. But he, he, he's trained to look for contraband, syringes, cash, drugs. He doesn't find what I've written down. At the end of the visit, my aunt goes to the guard, whatever, and gets that. She took that stuff home, typed it up, on, um, emailed it to my parents, and they started the blog, John's Jail Journal, J-O-N-S, yes. Jail's Journal. And if anyone who wants to research my story can see these original blog entries that I wrote, they're all, it's all, it, the whole trajectory is online. Now, I thought only, you know, my family and friends would read it. But um, when I was moved over to Supermax after my sentencing hearing, I did, um, I did a piece with The Guardian and they put, they put like a cockroach on the front page. Because yeah. it was all about living with the cockroaches. It was, yeah. I did it in this black humorous tone. Mm. And then the BBC did a piece on it. And um, the blog, since that period of time, has so had, was, has yeah. had momentum, <laughs> has had momentum, which yeah. led to the establishment of the YouTube channel. So mm. my mission was to show the public the human rights violations in Sheriff Joe Pyle's jail, the, Ma the, Max the Maximum Security Madison Street Jail. And that jail was closed down a couple of years later. I'm not taking Full credit for that, we were working with a group of activists, including Mothers Against Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Um, but hopefully we, we did play a role in exposing what was going on there. So my mission was to expose what was going on in that jail, hopefully get it shut down, and to humanize prisoners, to show the public that prisoners were humans. Because after we started writing about the conditions, we focused on specific prisoners, including two Tonys, including T-Bone, who was a US Marine, who was using his skills as a US Marine to stop prison rape. And the blog became a bridge to the outside world for us.
Right. Because over time, once I was in a lesser security levels, my family were able to print out the blog entries and all of the comments from the readers and send them to us in the prison. And all the prisoners I'd been writing about would mob into my cell and read. So Two Tonys is reading a question from a school teacher in Singapore about his mafia life in the Bonanno crime family. And he's like, oh my God, I thought I would never speak to anyone outside of these prison walls again. And to him, that bridge to the outside world was mm. so important. Yeah. So it was all written content because I was in prison. Mm. When I got released, my dad had already established the YouTube channel back in 2007. And we started to slowly move the written content over into video format. And it was only about three years ago. I mean, for the first 10 years of my YouTube channel, I had less than 10,000 subscribers. So about three years ago or so, I started to write, um, to do videos on Making a Murderer. I went on True Geordie and that just lit a fire. And I realized- sort of layering, yeah. layering the content, yeah. I realized we can get this message out to a much wider audience, but all it had been was my prison story and other prison stories. Mm. So then we decided to branch out from it just being a prison channel to becoming full on true crime. We should start to interview victims of crime to show the full extent of what crime does. So we started to interview crime victims, victims in the Epstein case, which was suggested to us. I interviewed Maria Farmer before she was legally gagged. Victims of horrific childhood abuse, um, paedophilia, um, and it just, it, it, it broke my heart to, to learn, not just from the prisoners who I was housed with, why, I wanted to find out why they were on heroin, because I thought before I got arrested, heroin addicts lock them up for the key, they live on the bridges, they, they rob people. It's just an avid drug. Yeah, yeah. But once I, I lived with heroin users, hardcore heroin users for, for almost six years, and also interviewed many people who have been victims of sexual trauma, childhood sexual trauma, I learned that's why they were on the drugs because of that and they hadn't been given the tools to deal with it. So we've put together this entire trajectory of childhood trauma leads to mental instability and the young person then gets into drugs and crime and to finance it, if it's a woman, they usually become a sex worker or if it's a man, they deal drugs or they rob to finance, Sean, to finance Sean, it. look, my yeah, yeah. clear experiences, and I've been with some of the best counsellors yeah. you would ever meet, super talented people, is drugs, especially addiction, will give people their own personal hell. It is predictably yeah. boring when you know how it works, but it will give, it will shape the user's own personal hell, and it is progressive. So look, I want to go a bit deeper with this. I want to push and bullet, it. right? And yeah, I want to be jaw. Right, so you look, so, I get it, I get the emotive journey, I get the passion, I get the light coming out the other side, wanting better things. I get being touched emotionally and aligning that with your trauma and getting more of a depth of understanding on that and wanting to do something, wanting a better life, wanting to change for the better, coming over your own redemption arc, right? So, you know, you start with the blog and, you know, that's kind of going well. You see that's working, you're enjoying it, you're getting into the media, you're starting to get exposure. But behind that, what are, you, what are your drivers and what are you feeling? What are you feeling? You've just come out, right? This is all new. You know, we've been there. It's, it's kind of working. Now, I know that... Um, Transformation is a process, Sean. It certainly was for me. It doesn't happen overnight. Rome is not built in a day. So what is the transformational story points, the elements? What are you actually feeling? What is pushing you forward? Man, I was released to my parents' house. All my assets were seized. And yeah, you know, being released, just being able to walk down the street and buy a banana was the heights of ecstasy for me. But then I started to get a bit depressed because I couldn't get a job. I was working on my book, but that's a, a, a multi-year thing. Mm. The doll is telling me, you need to get a telesales job and we're gonna set some interviews up for you. And I went to those interviews and when I told them I had a criminal record, they wouldn't 
accept me. So the doll started putting pressure on me, saying, you, from now on, you're best off not telling them you've got any criminal history. And then the mental health team, they asked me if I'd been on medication in prison. I said, yeah, you know, prison's crazy, and sometimes you've got to do it if you're feeling suicidal, and but now I'm out of prison, I don't feel crazy anymore. And they said, well, when you don't feel crazy, that's grandiosity, and we want to get you back, not just back on the meds, but we want to double them. And they started to threaten to do blood tests and house visits and all this other stuff. And it was just getting crazier and crazier. And then, I, I, you know, so many good people came into my life to help me, Stephen, because I was on benefits for the first five years from my release. And one of those good guys is a guy called DJ Hot Wheels, who formerly supplied me ecstasy out of California, out of LA. Um, he's a Manchester fellow, rave DJ. He got released a few years before me, and he ended up um, living in Guildford, and in a nice historic cottage. And he said, "Look, you know, you've much more chances of getting your life and career going if you're down south. Everything, you know, all the connections in London. Just come and live with me." So, him, you know, allowing me to live with him, with someone who I was on the level with from our previous raving days, was like. A protective bubble I needed because it helped you elevate psych your life psychologically right? helped me elevate in life and when I did move into his house my medical file didn't transfer so all these that mental health team man they brought they said we're gonna bring in the local district manager to find out if you're seriously mentally ill or whether you're just a bubbly eccentric and they brought in the Romanian and this panel of people and they were asking me all these questions. And I thought I was about to get sectioned. Well, I need to get the Sean, hell out. Sean, you know, yeah, I yeah. mean, I've certainly been in special units where they yeah. deal with special kind of cases, right? Yeah. With these kind of people who are quite crazy themselves, frankly, right, and their methods. Studying me like a, like a budding flower or a, I don't know, right? I get it. I really do. So, look, you know, so, you know, that really helped you elevate your life, you know, and then I know you went on, you, that strengthened you, you know, in the needed ways, you know, you went on with the channel. So, look, now, so with the drivers, so, you know, I'm starting to get an understanding now of the drivers and your trajectory with this stuff, right? So, so you're going forward, you start to get exposure and different stuff. Now, what internal personal problems are you having at this point, apart from all this? Let's cover it, Sean, right? All right, let's keep going with what you said then. So, I'm in the house down south, and I'm writing, you know, like I said, I throw my manic energy into everything. Get up at, you know, whatever time in the morning, get my cheese on toast, get it in front of my computer, and I'm on my computer until I go to bed. I've been doing that since I got out of prison. So, more wonderful guardian angels come into my life. First off, huge shout out to prisoners abroad. They entered a short story of mine with my mum, because my mum did it as well with prisoners abroad. And I won a short story contest and I got to read it at the um, Royal Albert Hall, Royal Festival Hall to an audience. And I met the Kersler Trust people whom I won a prize for my writing and they put me on the mentor scheme. The mentor scheme, they assigned me a published author who came from some remote bird watching island of Scotland to meet me in the British library. Just God bless all of these people. And she, within a year of her working her magic, I had a couple of literary agents on the table which helped my, you Not know, your rank, right? and then that led to Random House and everything else that you mentioned. Mm. I was under um, the illusion, um, I was in a pipe dream world of thinking that if you become an author, that's it then, you've got it made. No, there's a lot of work to be done. According, to, the, you according to Society of Authors, yeah. it's one of the lowest paid professions in the country. Mm. So me Takes and- Takes more than talent. I managed to get my book in Waterstones and me and my mum were doing these book signings at Waterstones and I'm not talking like we get there and people are lined up at a table. I'm talking me and my mum arrive when Waterstones opens and when Waterstones closes and we are handing out leaflets to people all day long and putting them in headlocks to buy the book. We are doing that for five years 
selling a hundred thousand pounds worth of books a year. And how much do you think my check was from Random House every six months? Oh, I can imagine, you know, I have literary agents. We do a lot of the work ourselves with publishers now, but you know, I know, I know the, uh, the margins are not what people would think. And it takes a lot of marketing after the book to position the book correctly, John. So I could. Two grand every six months. I'm not surprised. So, so. I know it takes <laughs> so much more than that, right? So these, these are my hardworking wilderness years. Um, the first five to ten years after my release. Now, all those great people helped me and the success started to begin. Hmm. And I suddenly have this platform now and I'm thinking, right, my mission is to, you know, help people who've been in prison. All those, these great people have helped me. So, yeah, so the mission, now, you know, we're going we're gonna to define this a little bit more. Hmm. Now I'm getting to it, is the mission is to help people, you know, in prison. Because you have been helped. Now look, you know, that makes sense to me, right? Because it's obvious, right? And it's that old adage, you know, where when you do good things, good people will help you. This is what it's about. But it's about doing good things consistently with a lot of hard work for a long time, Sean. This is success, right? It takes 10 years to get successful at anything. It can be, yeah, of it blood, takes a long blood time. Of blood and sweat, everything I've done. Blood, sweat and tears. Stock market, ecstasy trafficking, yeah. YouTube, yeah. blogging, yeah. author, it takes time. all of them have taken at least It takes time, years. the yeah. right people, and real tenacity, yeah. you know, and yeah. a lot of other stuff, right? Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of giving, a lot of giving, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, consistently. Right, so look, you know, now you've gone on now, you know, the YouTube, um, channel you've got it's really successful i think you know you're 600 and maybe 60k plus give or take subscribers you know i know you have a that's a massive audience you know by any standards you're very very prolific now look you know i'm going to put it out there because it's the truth and it is what it is right anyone who is really successful and i know a lot of people they bluff their success right you know, you're sitting in my house now, Sean, and other stuff, mm. and you see, you see success, right? I know a lot of people, they bluff success, what they are, what they've got, all the rest of it. To actually be in that and doing it is something else. And when you do get very successful, you can see the difference in people. Not necessarily because you're clever, but because you've jumped them fences and you've been there. And you know exactly where they are in their development. You can't be bluffed because you see it, because it's the same road, no matter what industry it is, for everyone, right? And the proof is in the pudding, right? But I know that with success, it brings a lot of other things with it, Sean, right? It brings a lot of jealousy, even from those closest to you, can be the worst, right? It brings it now, you know, I have to say it, and I'm gonna go straight for it. There is a lot of controversy, Sean, around you at the moment. I've met you, I know, I may know and know a lot of other people involved. There's no names here. That is not what this is about. But, you know, I have to ask you, and I'm going to ask you straight, about a lot of controversy because of different success and this on YouTube. What do you say to all this stuff? And I'm not even going to go over okay. it. People okay. will know. Let's, let's, know. Let's, what let's, do you say to I this stuff? I would like to go over some of it as to how this came about. So, I said to you that my mission became to help people who've been in prison. And I became in a position to do that because so many wonderful people helped me. So one of the first person I helped was my very first podcast guest. This is a guy who spent 34 years in California prison for a crime he hadn't committed. And while he was in prison for that crime, he learned that he'd been adopted. He was born on the Isle of Man and been sold to an American couple. He wasn't even a US citizen. So he was sent back to the UK where he did not know anybody. Prisoners abroad, Guardian Angels for prisoners overseas, UK citizens, had hooked him up with a pen pal call, um, and he was living with this woman out of London. He did not know anybody. So I had him on the podcast, Prisoners Abroad approached me, I had him on the podcast, and um, it went viral. And then, because he said some things about his military career, another huge YouTuber who outs people for stolen valor attacked this guy. And because he didn't have any internet presence, they attacked my internet presence. So I woke up one morning, all my websites were down, all my bank information and home address were online. 
all my um, social media platforms were getting hacked. This guy had connections with, he worked for Blackboard, he had military connections all over the world. People were threatening to like, they basically were saying snipers were going to be coming in my back garden. And it was like something out of a Why movie. would they be doing this, Sean? Why? Why would they be doing it? Because of this guy? Because his video went viral. Anything what, that and gets... he had some really bad content in there? What was wrong? Was lies? He embellished it? I mean, what? It doesn't need to be, Stephen. No, I get that. I all get that, but I'm just, is... trying to get, I'm just trying to the, get to the... the real clarity of it. Everything that is successful mm. has a backlash. And trolls feed into this to try and knock you down. So, poor old... Jamie Morgan Kane, my first guest, we raised money for him. People sent money in. Poor old Jamie Morgan Kane's GoFundMe was destroyed by these evil, jealous trolls accusing him of completely fabricating his life story. Now, I thought, all right then, I know a way. I don't have the resources, the legal resources to get his story verified, but I know someone who does. So I introduced him to a friend at Mirror Books. And Mirror Books has a massive multi-million pound legal department. And they spoke to him and watched him speak and liked his story. And they said, look, to publish your story as a book, you need to bring us all of the documents from your life, hundreds of pages of documents for our legal department to go over. And guess what? His they story, verified it. They verified it. And this just shows, because at the, at, the, at the peak of when the trolls were attacking him, I'm like half believing some of the things they're saying and thinking perhaps that they're right. But you know what? These are absolutely evil, jealous people who see someone who's got nothing. All of a sudden, kind people from all over the world are donating money for him. And they're sat behind their keyboards and they're so peevish, they want to knock that down. And there are lynch mobs of these people operating right now. And they've, I feel sorry for them. They've got mental illness. Look, Sean, it's a fact. I mean, I'm very thick-skinned. I really don't give yeah. a shit. I've been through, you know, I mean, I've had people who was the closest to me, known me for 25 years and set me up and get me killed. Yeah. I'm too wise in the ways of the world, and I love, hum love human beings. I'm a humanitarian. You know, people know my story. I'm a peace ambassador. I do immense stuff behind the scenes for what I believe in, for the right, real stuff. You know, I was nominated for an International Peace Prize, but I know human beings have wretchedness in them. Yes. The same way that I, I did back in the day and it overpowered me, and it's in there. It's in the mix, right? That's it, period. That's how I see it. And when you get success, you know, the envy, the green eye, all of this stuff, it comes out. These haters whatever the one thing they don't get is what i've learned very very simply is they need to focus on their own success this is why they don't have anything me i'm so focused i'm focused on what i need to be doing and the right thing for the people that i love i not care about i put all my energy into that it is what it is right but we do get this so look you know so you're being attacked for a lot of different reasons. So let's test it again. So, right, I've got the success part, but why else would they be attacking you, Sean? Give me another reason why people would attack you. Okay, so in the last year, we have seen a plethora of true crime podcasts just start with people who perhaps have just got out of prison or perhaps are just new to YouTube. <laughs> and, you know... Guests that have come on my podcast, I've urged them to write their books and offer to publish them. I've urged them to start their own YouTube channels, which I would support. And I've totally encouraged people to do what I'm doing and become successful and that I would help them and support them to the fullest of my ability with the followers that we've got. But sadly, I've got to word this carefully because I have legal action against one person right now. Sadly, 
We don't want names this show. No, no, this no, is no, no. I wish hunt. It's not to drag any bullshit yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my podcast, and I'm going to do it the right way. But I'm going to ask the questions, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm not doing it lightly mm-hmm. because I'm about the truth, and I don't do the bullshit. And this is why I'm asking you sadly, in the right way. Sadly, why? some of those these people, people make this stuff up. Sadly, some of those people have tried to make power plays against me to take me down. And one of those people who was a principal in the things that were said about me, I won't mention his name, went on another podcast recently and said a specific person put him up to say all those things because that specific person didn't want to say them himself. And it's, it's brought my heart that it's come to this with people that all I have said is good things about and all I've done is help them over the years because you know, when I have a guest on my channel and then that guest goes on another channel, my views go up as well. I'm a collaborative personality type. I don't view all these people starting up in the true crime podcast world as my competition. I view them as people I can work with and we can share guests and get along with and build this community and build this content. But I've learned from the psychology books, people tend to be divided into two character traits when it comes to business and there's the competitive character trait and there's the collaborative and I'm the collaborative all day long but if a competitive if a collaborative person helps and works with a competitive person at some point those knives are coming they're going to come out and this is what I've learned and they're going to stab you in the back and you know what Stephen I'm actually glad, and, 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 and the low thing is, the low part about this is, this is how diabolical, they waited to time this power play until I was grieving over wild man's death. So one of those guys who had recently come out of prison, I was contacted, I watched him on another channel, I thought, man, this, is an, this guy's great, he's, he's, he's so emotional, he's got a fantastic story. You know, I'd love to get him on the channel, expand his audience. And um, I had a great day with him. And by the end of the day, you know, he would interviewed me, I'd interviewed him. He was saying how well it went. And I was even in talks with him to publish his book. But that person, um, sadly, did a video saying that he'd exposed me. Saying he exposed me. And one of the things he said he exposed me over was... He said, you know, I played on, on Atwood's ego, got him talking, he admitted he'd had a threesome with his wife on the wedding day. Now, if this person had done any research on me, he would have perhaps read my books or watched some of my videos. And everybody in the comments on this video where he said he was exposed me was saying, look, Atwood's been telling these stories for 10 plus years. If you'd have done your research, you'd know you've not exposed him. So I would like to ask anyone out there Tell me one thing I've been exposed for. Now, the nasty allegations that have caused this lawsuit, which this was the most diabolical thing, you know, just while man's dead and I'm grieving, um, particularly nasty allegations were made against me. And some of those people had big followings. And I was getting an influx of, you know, these hateful comments and losing subscribers. So after consulting it with a lawyer, I didn't properly understand the defamation laws in this country, but I certainly do now. Those people who've made those allegations against me, who said, with conviction, he is this and that, they now have to prove that. So I've spent a vast amount of money because I know these things cannot be proved. Those people now have to prove those things. So that's where the situation is at. And the other guy as well, who I went on and he interviewed me, he said, my story is fake because I don't look like a gangster. I had a dry mouth when I was being interviewed by a real gangster. And, you know, obviously um, everything's made up because of that. Stephen, I've got social anxiety. I've had it since I was a kid. I do get a dry mouth when I'm around people who are... You're put in a room with someone who's, who's grilling the, the fuck out of you. I'm going to get, get a dry mouth. It's a weird situation. And I went in there with an open heart because I'd seen this guy's story and my mission is to help people. And I was going in there, you know, to help him raise his profile, help him get more YouTube subscribers, which we did. We ended up getting him tens of thousands of YouTube subscribers 
And yet, he chose to put a video up saying, I've exposed that one. And he hasn't exposed <coughs> anything at all. Well, Sean, Sean, it's really Sean, sad. look. Really sad. You know, there's no names here. It's not about that. I, 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 it's just a question to you. Mm -hmm. It's all over the place. You know, so it would be muggy not even to ask that question in a direct way mm -hmm. and get your appropriate response. This is not about names. Anyone can take any inference, whatever they want from that. I don't do the witch hunt thing. And me, as you said about collaborative, I'm a successful businessman in many industries. If there's one thing I've learned is, especially from the old days and my journey is, I want to convert and I want around me powerful allies, not to create powerful enemies. That's me, that's simple, that's obvious. I'm wise, I wanna build, create, and it's one of the reasons why I have so many unbelievable top level contacts, and I expedite all my work so quickly with so much because of the wonderful people in my life. That is the way I do it. But look, thanks thanks for telling me you know, about that, Sean. I had to ask it, because there's all sorts of people, you know, in YouTube. You know, the other thing I will say about YouTube is, look, you know, we made this channel to really help people and come with other, you know, other value. I've got a film coming in my life. There's TV stuff and all that. It's not just about that. I'm, you know, successful anyway. This is another channel to help people, to help people and reach out to people in the same way. YouTube's a big place. You know, there's that there's you know enough room for everyone, exactly. right? There's enough room for everyone for what I'm seeing. It's global, you know, a global platform. That's all I'll say on the matter. But now, it, obviously, that's exactly what I said to Sammy the Balls people when they tried to get me to sell their pills. I said, "There's enough room for us all to coexist, and it's not each other that we need to worry about. It's the feds." Well, uh, Sean, look, you know, this is the thing. And, you know, another thing that I've seen as well on, you know, when you should be in this many acts, you see people, they just, they do all sorts of things. That's for them. I'm not going to say anything, you know, either way. It's my job here to really ask the direct questions in an entertaining and authentic way, right? So thanks for that, Sean. Now, look, the next question, the next question is, so... What are your drivers now? Where does Sean Atwood's career and where do you go from now? What do you see? Okay. What, 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 where are you going next? What is light in your fire, Sean? What is important to you now and going into the future? I've expressed my drivers in my free TED Talks in detail and how they came about, but just in summary. So, once I was, got over that hump of being suicidal and started to help the prisoners, I learned that when you help people, it is good for your soul and it puts a break on your ego. And being in a position to do that, I mean, that's what makes me sad about these guys who made this power play against me. I was gonna help them, continuously help them, hook them up with some big people. I had all these plans for them. It was so pointless. Anyway, going, going back to what you're asking about then is, I went from interviewing prisoners to interviewing victims of sex crimes and abuse and all this other stuff. And, for example, we had a victim on last Wednesday's live stream, a victim of Jean-Luc Brunel, who was procuring girls for Epstein, and also a victim of Peter Nygaard. And those women, when they were, it was like a live thing and all the comments were coming in saying, you are so brave. And these women were crying. And the comments were just like, you could see how it was lifting their spirits. You could see the difference you're making in people's lives. When we took Which is the thing. Jamie this Morgan... This is the thing, improving people's lives. When we took Jamie Morgan Kane In the right ways. Our first podcast guest, when we took Jamie Morgan Kane to the Isle of Man, where he was born and sold as a baby to an American family, and he spoke to an audience there, and he spoke at the prison there and you could see the light in his eyes he'd finally found his home this guy who knew nobody who came to london after serving 34 years the internet had completely bypassed you could see the changes you're making in people's lives when i'm on my deathbed am i going to look back on all the money i made in the stock market no i'm going to look back look back on the friendships the family and the, th the changes that I was able to make in people's lives, and they're the things I'm gonna be proud of. 
Sean, I have a friend, right? He's a billionaire now, right? He's a billionaire. It's as simple as that. He's into mining and other stuff that he does. But he told me one thing just a few years ago that always stuck with me. Because, you know, I, I go to him for some things if I have problems. So he's an unbelievably busy guy. But when I get time with him, it's very, very precious. And he said, Steve, look around you at all the people in your life all your inner circle, all the people in your life, if they are people that you would want standing with you at the very end, you're doing the right thing. If they're not, you may want to have a look at that and change some things. That has always stuck with me. It's so, so important, the people we have around us. So I have many, many wisdoms, knowledge, frameworks, engineering that I apply all my strategies to and take the learnings from stuff like this. Because I know it's the best learning at the highest level. It's the right answer. So, you know, what you're saying now, I mean, I get it. This is, the, this is what I uh, apply to my life, the people in my life, and the time and the energy that I give myself to is of paramount importance now. Those people that you are associated with determine how successful you're going to be so many years from now. And if you allow toxic people into that, then there are going to be problems down the road. And perhaps I should be grateful then that the people who did stab me in the back and make, try to make these power plays against me have revealed their true colors. I, I, I perhaps should thank them for doing that. Now, I am like a lone wolf person who's just driven to do his work. I mean, Wild Man called me the robot. That was his nickname for me. You mentioned about all these solid people, having solid people around you. Wildman was my childhood, you know, best friend of almost 40 years. Now, another reason, perhaps, I looked a bit down in the dumps when I did that video with that person who was interrogating me, was because Wildman had like less than a month to live. And he, I'd been on the phone, he'd be telling, you know, he'd be telling me what's going on with his, with his physical, um, stuff and when Wildman's funeral happened me and Wildman's cousin Hammy were just on the road outside of Wildman's house waiting for the funeral car to arrive and we were just joking you know how strong we were going to be when that car arrived and as soon as that car arrived, we just started crying our eyes out. And that car, I mean, the beginning of my story starts with me, Hammy and Wildman overlooking a quarry at this area of witness called Peck's Hill. And there was a tree, we used to sit on that tree and we called it the thinking tree. And I would say to those guys that I was going to go to America and make a million and fly you guys over. That's what I did. And, and Hammy would laugh at me because of my, I was stock trading at that age. He'd be like, yeah, well, you're stock trading. You're going to do it. And while mum would say, you know, I've got these red dots. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. As we were following the funeral car, it made a detour to go past Pex Hill. And... <laughs> It's all right, Sean, you know, you know, and, um, you know, this is life, but to feel life all the way through, you know, and, you know, to do your best, you know, and have their memories is, 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 you know, is richness, you know, itself. And to be vulnerable is one of, one of the greatest strengths too, in the right way, of course. I shouldn't be doing okay. this because here's what happened, right? All these people put out tributes for Wildman mm. and Wildman's hero when he was in prison was Brian the tax man cockerel and Brian called me and he's at a point and he said you don't need to be sad because I went I think he saw me on the true Geordie where I was crying and he said you don't need to be sad anymore Wildman wants you to have his strength and after after the funeral service it was it was amazing it was 30 minutes they had like a professional speaker just read Wildman's life like it was a chapter including the things that we did in Arizona. 
And um, ever since then, Steve and I have felt wild man strength in me. But the funny thing is, right after that funeral, it's like wild man from above, and I think he's still doing it, caused chaos with all those people who were attacking me. Because all those people who were attacking me from, right after that funeral started to attack each other. And the principals who were behind that power move, what they tried to do to me completely reversed on them and blew up in their faces. And ever since then, you know, you said I've got this controversy around me, but it's not, it's just confined within this group of toxic people and trolls. I've had people from all over the world say they've got my back. I've had the top gangsters from across this country call me up when all this was happening and say they've got my back. And I've got wild man up there slaughtering my enemies and protecting me from above. And since this year has started, everything has just been surging to record highs. And I, 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 it's wild man, he's up there, his strength is in me. And I just really appreciate what you're doing, brother. I've never thought we've been through it back in. I know, Sean, uh, you know, I mean, I really know, and I have know there's so many other people out there that know, you know, the death of Wild Man has been really, really hard for you. You know, and I get it. I mean, Sean, even me, for so many years of the trauma and what I went through, I couldn't feel tears, Sean. I was, like, emotionally bankrupt. Not that person today. So, you know, I understand vulnerability can be your greatest and is your greatest strength. When it's done in the right way, you have a fight, don't cry, do you? But when you feel a real emotion about something, about the right things, a man can cry about this stuff, Sean. It shows, it shows a lot of strength, a lot of humanity. And a lot of this interview has been about, it's always about the truth. I don't play games, but it's done in the right way, right? And you, you know, and I want to say, and I'm going to push and pull, people can make their own inference, you know, from that. I, there's no blame in here, there's no point in pointing fingers here, right? And um, so, you know, you've shown a lot in this interview, Sean, right? You really have, right? You know, thank you for that. It's not an easy thing, right? You know, there's been times I've pushed and pulled it in the right way, you see? Because I've learned you can be as ruthless as you want, but if your beating heart behind it is the right energy, you're always going to win. This is another thing with me. I bring the right energy. If I need to be ruthless, I'll be ruthless. It's as simple as that. Because if people are good, I'm going to find out. If they're bad, I'm going to find out. It's as easy as that. This is what I do in my business. I'm very successful because of it. More is always revealed, Sean, right? People are not stupid. It's up to them what they ascertain from that or what they don't, you know? Good luck to them for that, right? And, and one thing, Stephen, is I've never claimed to be a badass and I've never claimed to be a gangster. While man was the gangster who opened the door for me to meet those characters, I'm just like a stockbroker gone wild, a nerdy business graduate who had gangsteritis, who thought he was living like a character out of a movie. I'm not a big tough guy. I don't like violence and I don't like fighting. And I think what's caused some of the... Um, rivalries with these other new people is they see that I've accomplished a lot and they've seen that there's been some big news headlines about ecstasy kingpin and then they look at me as just this how how's this nerdy guy done this but I tell you what if any of those guys had got in a room with wild man and spoke to him like they spoke to me he would have knocked their fucking jaw off their skull and fucking from the body parts through a fucking window I can guarantee that and they wouldn't have been questioning his fucking authenticity. Sean, look, you know, I've been with the most dangerous people in the UK, in the most dangerous places in the UK. I was even termed as one of the most dangerous people in the UK. And my experience is anyone can be dangerous when they're put in the right corner. Even the most skinniest guy can stab you in the back and run. It's as simple <laughs> as that, really, right? So, you know, I, I there's a lot more reality to that kind of issue than the bullshit that's put out about it, right? So we'll leave that, you know, we'll leave that there. But look, Sean, listen, you know, I want to thank you for coming on, right? You know, I want to thank you for going deep. It's not easy. It's not easy. 
my intention was to push and pull you here, obviously, in the right ways, as I said, right? You did really good, man. I didn't expect to get emotional like this. But to give you the opportunity to reveal the truth. I mean, you're sitting across from someone who is far from silly, Sean, right? And very, very, very quick weird, right? So, well done for that. I'm sure there's times, you know, it hasn't been easy. But you've, you've revealed a lot of yourself, you know? A lot of the what Sean Atwood actually is, and this is what I was going for. So, Sean, thanks for that. Look, you know, and I wish you well on your journey, Sean. I do. I wish you well on your journey, right? With your work, you know, and all you're doing. I see the stuff that you're doing. It's out there. Everyone else can see the stuff that you're doing. Again, they can take their own influence, you know, from that. I personally had my questions, you know, for you, and I asked for proofs directly as You've I read do. The paperwork. You've shown me proofs and stuff that I wanted to see. You know, I said I'm happy with that. Sean Atwood, you know, I know, you know, you'll come back another time, you know, we'll do some more content. Thanks for coming on, Sean. Thanks for having me on. I think it's been um, like an emotional journey today. And I feel like a sense of relief that you have enabled me to say these things that are being channeled to me through Wildman. Because I think Wildman wants people to know these things. And despite the controversy that was circulated by these toxic people, you know, I just want to thank all my followers and all my subscribers because they, these guys stick behind me no matter what bullshit is thrown our way and they enable everything to go from strength to strength. So love and respect to all the people who are, all the wonderful messages that came in um, when Wildman died, all of the love and support. It was trending on Twitter for so many hours, RIP Wildman, I had no idea that many people followed him and loved him. I was just blown away. His whole family was really blown away. Tr trending on Twitter for like six hours, RIP wild man, which means someone was posting a message every minute. It's quite something. Just that love, just to feel that love come in. And um, you know, that just washes away this fraction of toxic trolls and uh, idiots just making allegations that they can't prove. And like you said, you've read the paperwork, you've come here today, asked me these solid questions, and it's great um, to be able to lay to rest the bullshit. Thanks for coming on, Sean. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Cheers. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share. Go into Stephen Gillen com for more fascinating content to help you expedite your own journey of success.